21. Well, let me read it in, in, in its entirety as we get started so that we can have it set before us. For the director of music, a psalm of David. This now is the 20th psalm of David out of the 21 psalms. Only Psalm 1 has not been a psalm of David thus far. We're still in the first of five books in the psalms. And the first, five, or the first book goes through Psalm 41. O Lord, the King rejoices in your strength. How great is his joy in the victories you give. You have granted him the desire of his heart and have not withheld the request of his lips. You welcomed him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked you for life, and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. Through the victories you gave, his glory is great. You have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. Surely you have granted him eternal blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. Through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will lay hold on all your enemies. Your right hand will seize your foes. At the time of your appearing, you will make them like a fiery furnace. In his wrath, the Lord will swallow them up, and his fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, their posterity from mankind. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. For you will make them turn their backs when you aim at them with drawn bow. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your might. For the sake of a title, I have called this psalm celebrating an anniversary and it is an excellent anniversary psalm whether it's a birthday anniversary or a wedding anniversary and the reason why i'm calling it an anniversary psalm becomes apparent when you look at the other royal psalms that we have examined thus far in the psalter psalm 2 was the first of the royal psalms and it was a psalm of kingly installation you have set your king on Mount Zion's holy hill. What are the nations, therefore, who are gathered against you? They're nothing. Uh, psalm 18 is a psalm that gives thanks by the king for victory. Uh, the battle has been secured, and the Lord has accomplished his, uh, his power in it. Psalm 20, the third uh, kingly psalm we've looked at so far in the Psalter is, and, and this is what we shared last week, is a prayer before going into battle. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. So there have been three different moments thus far in the life of the king when a prayer has been offered. Now, Psalm 21, most uh, Bible scholars feel, is a psalm which was used as part of the anniversary celebration for one of the kings of Israel, beginning with David and then on to David's successors for two centuries following that, that the, the great day of the anniversary would come and the choirs would be gathered and they would, the people would all be out in the temple mount or in some public area and the priests and the Levites would all be arranged uh, as a great biblical choir and maybe a, a priest would act as cantor or lead singer. And uh, there would this this psalm is very similar as a public liturgical act of worship. Isn't that a great word, liturgical? It comes from the Greek word liturgos, which means priestly worship. But it uh, uh, they were it's it's very similar in its outline to Psalm 20. Remember in Psalm 20 we said that the the psalm starts off with someone singing to the king. Verses one through five were a song to the king, and then verse six through eight were the king's response, and then the last a third of the psalm was uh, everybody joining in on a benediction. Well, this Psalm 21 takes pretty much the same motif. There is uh, first of all in verses one through seven a part where uh, the, there is an emphasis upon the king and the Lord. And uh, maybe the, the, uh, uh, the, the priest or the choir is, uh, is, first of all, singing of the relationship of the king to the Lord on his anniversary day. And then the middle part of the psalm, verse 8 through 12, focuses upon the theme of the king and his enemies. And they are looking back both at uh, how the Lord has helped in the past, but mainly the, the thrust of that segment of the psalm is forward. Because um, an anniversary is not simply a celebration of what has been. It is an anticipation of what is yet to occur. Then the last uh, part of Psalm 21 is uh, the Lord alone. And it is uh, uh, like the end of Psalm 20, everyone joining in on uh, praise together. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. Now, before we start looking verse by verse at this psalm, I want to approach... Once more, the whole idea of how we interpret a psalm like this. I'm very comfortable as I read verses 1 through 7. I am somewhat uncomfortable 
uh, you want to remember the Lord's word on loving your enemies, as I read verses 8 through 12, and I'm trying to think, O oh Lord, who, in, who around me do I want to pray that their descendants be destroyed from the earth and that they perish? And so that part of the psalm gives us pause. And then we want to say, too, well, after all, if this was a liturgical psalm that was used for King's anniversary, what's that got to do with us uh, living in 1986 in the middle of June in Southern California and uh, none of us are living in palaces and nobody's had a liturgical service in honor of our anniversary lately. And, uh, in fact, uh, you might say I forgot to send a card to my wife or husband on our last anniversary, I didn't even remember it, you know, let alone celebrate it. No, no, nobody in here would belong to that category, right? You just had 47 Ray in Virginia last Wednesday and came to church. I, that's great. That's where you met, so you came and celebrated on your 47th. I think that's super. All right. I look at a psalm like this three ways, and, I, and I, I think this is fair, and this is scriptural, because after all, this scripture was not just written for David, it was written for us, if we believe what Second Timothy 3.16 tells us, that all scripture is given for our prophet. The three ways that I look at this is, first of all, this psalm does relate to David and the kings which followed him. That's, that's fair. That's uh, the historical approach to scripture that looks at it and says, well, this had meaning within the context in which it first came into, uh, the Holy Spirit first brought it into existence. Second way that I relate this psalm is that all the psalms must be related to Christ, for the Psalter was his prayer book, and I think Christ is the only one who has hands pure enough to pray any prayer about enemies and judgment, because he will not, uh, when he prays that kind of a prayer, it will not uh, be a, I'm going to get even with you kind of a prayer, but it will be a, a prayer that comes from a holy life and a holy heart. And besides, when we read the first part of Psalm 21, we see how excellently it, has been, it is fulfilled in the Lord's own life and death and resurrection. And then the third way that we ought to pray uh, this kingly psalm, as we pray, I think, all the psalms, is that, that it relates to us who are called in the New Testament kings and priests unto God. So we are also in the kingly line. And it is, it is possible... Therefore, to look at this psalm and internalize it, make it relevant to our present-day experience. I think it's also possible when we read a psalm like this, and especially focus on the first seven verses, to acknowledge the fact that we may not be able to sing all of the verses in this psalm right now in our life. You may just have had a string of unbroken, unmitigated disasters. And you're sitting here this evening and you're saying, I defy you to get me to say, the Lord has granted me the desire of my heart. <laughs> and I think we must recognize when we look at the Psalter, that there are moments when we need to step outside of this present moment and say there is go there going to be a moment in our life, and this moment may not occur till we're even within the frame of eternity where we look back and say, well, if I'm not able to say that right now, there will be a day when I'm able to say that wholeheartedly, unequivocally, without any fear of contradiction, because this prayer will ultimately be prayed by every one who is a king unto God. And since we're going to pray it in the future, if we're not able to pray it now, we might as well do a little bit of theology, uh, theologizing, which I think the writers of Revelation did. The writers of Revelation, they were in a time, or not the writers, the church in, described in Revelation was in a time when it was getting whipped around. And the uh, political powers which were persecuting and making them martyrs seemed also very strong. But they took a moment and got up to heaven and heard the angels and all the hosts of heaven saying, The Lord God omnipotent rain, reigns. And they borrowed a little bit of that atmosphere. It's sort of like reaching into a cloud, grabbing a patch off and jamming it into the presence and saying, into the present, saying, Well, if the Lord God is going to reign then, then we'll just say he's reigning now. And uh, that's taking the future and making it present in our lives. So we want to do this. Even if maybe today we don't feel like the Lord has granted us the desire of our heart, there will be a time when that is ultimately experienced by us. We also 
could recognize that in the earthly ministry of Jesus, there were times in Jesus' earthly life when this prayer would have had a hollow ring on his lips. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, for example, he would not have been able to say in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, that you have uh, not withheld the request of my lips. He could not say in the Garden of Gethsemane, you put a crown of pure gold on my head. In fact, in the cross, he's given a crown of thorns. It's that even in the Lord's life, there were times when this, this psalm, in order to be fulfilled, had to, get, had to wait a few days for its fulfillment. And, of course, when the Lord is resurrected from the dead, then the psalm fits and describes him perfectly, completely. I was listening to a tape this week of a minister who had been healed of cancer, and he was talking about the, uh, the phrase that I might, from Philippians 3, that I might know him and the fellowship of his sufferings it was one of the sub-themes of the sermon. And one of the things that he said that really struck me was that sometimes when, when we come to um, prayer, the, the Lord has, lets us walk through a, an experience that uh, we wish would, would uh, change. Uh, but it doesn't immediately. He, he described an experience where, where he had counseled with a lady who had had a daughter, a teenage daughter, killed in an automobile accident. And this daughter, uh, the mother had been, um, had dedicated this girl to the Lord and had prayed that she'd you know, be a pastor's wife or a missionary or something like that. And when the daughter was killed in the crash, the mother became so embittered against God that she dropped out of serving Christ altogether. And this minister was, was using as a, as a particular illustration that there are moments in our life when we are, when we are just like Christ in Gethsemane. And, uh, and we are sweating. And we're struggling. And it's not, uh, so, he asked you for life and you gave it to him length of days forever and ever. It's death seems right there. And we have to know Christ in his suffering if we're also going to know him in his resurrection. But, but know him in his resurrection, we will. Um, of course, King David, in his life, saw the literal fulfillment of this psalm. And I would suggest that uh, probably when we pray this psalm, we're going to see in our own experience some of the, uh, the King David elements where God gives us a special victory upon the way, and we may see some King Jesus elements where we're not able to sing this psalm totally until we're, we're through on the other side of the resurrection. Um, this psalm then, let's look at it verse by verse and get rid of, get past the introduction. Look at the first third of the psalm, which is, we'll subhead the king and the Lord, because that's the focus, the king's relationship to the Lord, to Jehovah, 1 through 7. These seven verses celebrate seven reasons why the king has joy on his anniversary, and I think that they are good ways that we can celebrate God's presence in our life also. The first is victory. Oh, Lord, the king rejoices in your strength. How great is the joy in the victories you give, I'll tell you, it is a wonderful thing to feel like you have won. It's great when the award comes through, isn't it, Irene? It's great when the contract is signed that makes the difference between starvation and plenty. It's an exhilarating experience for a young person to um, get the word, yes, I will marry you from the person they're courting. It's a uh, it's a marvelous thing to go through victory. And anniversaries, part of an anniversary experience ought to be celebration of victory. Because anniversaries, whether they're birthdays or weddings or whatever, can focus upon defeats and losses and missed opportunities. And I'm sure David had his share of defeats and losses and missed opportunities. But the focus of the celebration is God has given us victory. And there are no victories if there are no battles. And there are no battles if we do not take risks. So the king has gone out and risked, and the Lord has granted victory. His strength is greater than ours. That's why we've won. My nephew-in-law, Keith Kraft, who's married to my brother's uh, girl, was visiting us last week, and we had uh, gone out with him to get a bite to eat, and he couldn't wait to demonstrate to us his new strength that he had acquired. He's a member of the John Jacobs Power Team, which is doing evangelistic meetings all over the United States to thousands and thousands of young people in high school assemblies and uh, 
uh, large churches, and uh, they they do all kinds of things like breaking a block of ice 15 foot high with their head, and and uh, they get they get the kids out by these feats of strength. And Keith's big guy; he's about six six. Would you say, Larry? Keith's about six six or six four, six seven. He is big and he's muscular and he tried out for the Dallas Cowboys as lineman one year and I don't know that didn't work out but he's he's that kind of uh, capacity but I've I've never seen him do anything like this he has already learned since he's been a member of this power team and he showed us he sat in our living room took a yellow page telephone book that thick and broke and just tore it in, and neatly in half just you know it was marvelous feet of strength I took a little littler telephone book later and I Tried my best, but I didn't get anywhere on it. And then he got a pair of police handcuffs and put those on, and and uh, he then went to work. And I'll tell you, his veins and his head and his arms popped out, looked like they were going to bust. But after about four yanks uh, at four different moments on those cuffs, he had broken those those uh, police cuffs. I couldn't believe anybody could pop handcuffs like that. And I uh, when I looked at those feats of strength and I thought about that later, there's so many things I'm not strong enough to do. But what this psalm is celebrating for the king is, well, King David, no matter what your strength is, you weren't strong enough for a lot of things, but the Lord was strong enough for them. So celebrate on your anniversary, celebrate his strength. We owe our success, whatever it is, to the Lord. Uh, one commentator said, how often we. How often do we fail in the great battle of life by being too self-reliant? If we cannot sing a note in honor of our own strength, we can at any rate rejoice in our omnipotent God. Think for a moment of any victory tonight that you feel like celebrating and say to the Lord, Lord, you got me that victory. And then project past that to think of all the victories in heaven that you're going to be enumerating that you don't feel right now like maybe you don't feel like hallelujah, amen. But project out in that day all the things you're going to say, God, it was your strength that did it. Can you name at least one victory in your life that God, that is attributable to God alone? Anchor it to this psalm when you read verse 1. Thanksgiving for victory. There's joy because there's victory. The next reason why there is joy is because, verse 2, there have been desires granted. You granted him the desire of his heart and have not withheld the request of his lips. At first I called this verse answered prayer. You know, we rejoice when our prayer is answered. But then I realized that I had that's not right because all prayer is answered. I was just saying answered prayer equals yes is answered prayer. But there's obviously answered prayer that is no, and there's answered prayer that is wait a while, and then there's answered prayer that is yes. So I decided to rename this desire granted. It had been a desire of the heart, and it became a request of the lips. It was Charles Spurgeon, I think, that said, what is in the well of the heart is sure to come up in the bucket of the lips. Isn't that great? Think of, now think of your old farmhouse with a well out in the back. What is in the well of the heart is sure to come up in the bucket of the lips. And those are the only true prayers where the heart's desire is first and the lips' request follow after. If our desires are not being granted, then we might just ask for a moment, where is the roadblock? to our desires being granted. Is that is the roadblock within us? Is there disobedience or wrongful motivation within our own life that prevents us? Is it that we're expecting something to happen overnight that is going to take time to accomplish? Um, is our desire being blocked because God is allowing another person to exercise their own free will? Uh, is it being blocked because there is spiritual warfare going on? I found there have been times when my, really I've had to fight through things in prayer, not because of any lack of my own part or not because anyone else was blocking it, but, but there was just simply spiritual conflict involved. Is the desire not being granted because God is bringing other things to pass which are refining and tempering and even going to change my desire and turn it into something greater than it started out being? But the believer all knows that in, a, in, a, in an ultimate sense, all desires are granted. Um, 
One glimpse of his dear face, the hymn writer said, all sorrow will erase. And there are a lot of desires that God grants in life in this present moment. I, for example, one of my great heart's desires in life was that if I ever had children, they would turn out all right. I'm not quite ready to say that they've turned out all right, okay? They're 19 and 17, and I'm, you know, praying a lot, got my fingers crossed, but that's a desire I ask uh, of the Lord. And uh, some of you say, boy, you know, I've been praying for my kids, and I'm not sure they're going to turn out all right. Well, keep praying. But maybe some things that, that were desires of yours, God's granted that maybe I had those same desires, and he hasn't granted them to me, you know? But um, there will be a day which, uh, when all desires will have been fulfilled. The third thing that uh, David rejo- has joy over on, his, on the anniversary is uh, position. Verse 3, you welcomed him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. He is describing, the, thinking back to the time when he was installed as king. And not only did the people welcome him, but God proclaimed him his anointed one. Of course, this has a great deal of significance on the lips of Jesus as well, whom God welcomed and anointed him as king. Does God have a a sign out over his door, do not disturb? Uh, Well, this psalm is saying no. He welcomes us in his presence. And he welcomes with rich blessings. And he gave the king a crown of gold. God intends to lavish on his people rich gifts. I got to thinking about that. What would I do if right in the here and now the Lord gave me a crown of gold? Yeah, you're right, Ray. I would sell it. (laughs) I would take that thing and I would put it in the bank and I would spend it slowly but surely. Because I would only enjoy a crown of gold if I had all kinds of other wealth that would make it worth my while just to keep this as an object of pleasure. And David was so wealthy as a king that, hey, he could keep a crown of gold, and, you know, so what? I've got a lot of other things. That's just a symbol of my position. And God, um, you know, intends to lavish upon us his, his riches. Um of Christ the King, in fact. Uh, when we think of this psalm as relating to him, the hymn writer says, crown him with many crowns. And uh, John says in Revelation 19.12 that when Christ comes, he wears many crowns. And you wear many crowns because you're king over many things. If you're only king of one country, you only wear one crown. But if you're king over five countries, you can wear the crown of each country. And he will not only give us a crown of gold, but he will, as the scriptures say, give us a crown of life. And give us a crown of recognition. Then there is a, a fourth thing that is given to, um, to cause joy, and that is, verse 4, eternal life. The covenant that God made with David called for him to have an eternal reign. That is, not him personally, but his descendants would always reign on the throne. And the Old Testament makes a great deal of this promise to David. And the New Testament does too, because it's fulfilled in Christ. So this psalm is celebrating the immortality of David's line, but it's also celebrating the immortality of all those who follow Christ. I have discovered in studying this psalm that this is an excellent funeral psalm. Can you think for a moment of a a situation, and some of you have been through this, so you know very painfully what I'm talking about, where maybe a person in their 30s or early 40s is cut down in life. And we say something on that occasion, well, like at a service, well, you know, they were taken before their prime, or they were taken in their prime, or maybe a young man, 19 years of age, you know, we say, well, he was gone before his prime. But that's earth time point of view. And if you overlay that with Psalm 21 and say at such an occasion, um, you have granted him the desire of his heart and have not withheld the request of his lips. You welcomed him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold in his head. He asked for life and you gave it to him length of days forever and ever. Wow. That puts a whole different perspective on it. New Interpreter's Bible says that there's no more heartwarming phrase in the presence of death to be found in all the Psalms. If once we let 
Christ himself utter these words, it can echo in the mind with great comfort if we are thinking of a brave youth dead ere his prime. You have given him victories, and he asked for life, and you gave it to him length of days forever and ever. A fifth cause for joy is a noble self-concept. Verse 5. Through the victories you gave, his glory is great. You have bestowed upon him splendor and majesty. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all felt that our glory was great and we were enveloped in glory and majesty? There are some believers these days who are into aura reading. I don't know that I should use the word uh, believers of such a craft, but, uh, but so, the, so the idea goes that if you're in a right relationship with God, you will project an aura out of your body. An aura of light will surround you. And I even had a person uh, uh, told me that they were very concerned about what was happening in their life because somebody had walked into a room and said to them, Brother, something's been happening to you. If you've been going to the wrong church, your aura used to project 20 feet out of your body and now it's shrunk down against your skin and it's hardly visible at all. What are you doing? You know, and they were all concerned about the, the fact that their aura had fallen. I'm saying, what kind of a crazy idea is that? But it's a heavenly idea. I don't think there's an aura on earth. I could be, you know, I don't, the scriptures I don't see ever teaching that. And I think it could very easily get into a cultic phenomenon. But certainly the scriptures talk about God dwelling in unapproachable light. And it talks about us as being children of light. And uh, we're going to be clothed, clothed in, in white. And I think uh, that our countenance will be like that of Christ in the transfiguration. His face shone and glistened. And here the Lord is saying to us, You have worth and dignity as my child. And no matter how down you feel about yourself or how rough uh, life has been to you, uh, you're a special person of dignity and honor. Self-concept. We all, I struggle a great deal with self-concept, as I'm sure you do as well. I hope that God continues to work on healing my self-concept so that I don't have to wait for all the healing to occur in heaven. I think it's uh, well for us to have uh, strength and dignity here, too, and to give people their strength and dignity. I'm finding as I live that one of the great curses that we all live with is struggling to meet some prophetic, not prophetic, but prophetic, or should I say perfect fantasy that we or someone else has about us. And we're not quite there, and therefore we figure until we can be perfect, we then are not clothed with glory and majesty and strength. But if I understand anything about justification, God has already declared us perfect. And that means in his eyes we're perfect and now we're growing and gaining. Staff coaxed me into changing my sermon on Father's Day uh, morning. We were, in, uh, we were in staff meeting lunch today and sharing together. And I, I don't know if somebody asked me what I was, if I was preaching a Father's Day message. And I said, well, no, I'm continuing my series from the letters of Jesus to the churches in Revelation. That's where we're at right now. I said, well, how come you're not preaching a Father's Day message? And I said, to tell you the truth, I find it very difficult to preach a Father's Day message because I figure until mine are successfully raised and gone, I don't have any right to tell anybody else how to bring up their kids. And besides, I've yet to find the perfect father. And, um, and I'm, I'm not sure I can tell anybody how to be, you know, the father they ought to be if, you know, if it's Father's Day. I said, in fact, I've gone through Scripture, and I have tried to find... A, a role model in Scripture of what I would imagine to be a perfect father. And you know, other than God and Joseph, the husband of Mary, I can't find any. There are... If you can find one, would you please tell me between now and Sunday? But there, the, all the models of fatherhood in the Scripture are broken. And yet, how much stress and problems come in family life because a spouse says to a husband, well, you're not a perfect father. You don't do this. Or the kids, you know, I held that again, and I shared that Sunday night a few weeks ago. I held against my dad for years. He wasn't the perfect father. The, I, the father I had fantasized as the father I wanted. And we take away strength and dignity from people when we, when we say, you've got to meet my perf perfect ideal before you're really clothed with glory and majesty. I find that God gives us glory and majesty in our fellowship with Him just on the basis of Christ's perfection, not our own. 
There is one example. I should get back to halos and auras just a moment because I really think that in that day we will glow, and it won't be the it won't be the spot on the spotlight shining off my palate up here that's that's glowing. You know, remember in Acts when Stephen is is dying, and he's before the people are going to stone him to death, and the scripture says that he, they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And I think by that they meant there was the halo. There was that, that radiant presence of God upon him. So, Lord, you've given me splendor and majesty, noble self-concept. The sixth thing that uh, David rejoices in is the, is the personal fellowship he has with God. Surely you've granted him eternal blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. Once the problem of sin is resolved, the prospect of being in God's presence is not a, one of dread, but of joy. And David, who knew personally the experience of being banned from a king's presence, and he was banned for years from Saul's presence, and he also knew the experience of, being, of banning his own son Absalom from his presence. He knew what it was like to be banned. So there's great joy in being in the presence of the king. And David says, the divine potentate has invited us to enjoy his presence. I came up with two words. The king of kings has invited us to enjoy his presence in his throne room and his dining room. Because when you look at the scripture, you find that we're going to stand before God's throne and we're going to rejoice with exceeding joy, but we're also going to be with him in the dining room at the married supper of the Lamb. And both the throne room and the dining room, the place of imperial majesty and the place of personal fellowship, are going to be um, great. We can say, you know, personal fellowship with God. How is God going to find time for each one of us individually? I don't know how God's going to do that. To me, that's one of the miracles of his omnipresence, his being everywhere at once. But he's going to somehow do it. I think of of how much time I've spent with my kids this week versus, you know, how, what God's going to spend time with us. And and my model parent is Susanna Wesley, who had 19 kids in 21 years. And she found, well, nine of them died before they were, you know, very old. But out of the ten remaining kids, she spent an hour a week with each kid alone. And that was, said the she said, and the kids later said, was the best time they ever had in their life, was the hour alone. God's going to find time to spend with us. So the joy in His presence is going to be something that's not simply peripheral. And we can spend joy in His presence now in prayer. I find that I need the lift of prayer. Um, I was in a presbytery meeting a few, a few weeks ago, and I guess one of the things that's concerning me more and more about the Church of Jesus Christ and how my attitudes are changing over the years is I've always been a bright, is it right or left brain? Left left brain when it comes to doing things in God's kingdom. I'm not a mystic. I say, well, if it's got to be done, how are we going to do it? And so I'm kind of a straight line thinker. And let's have a meeting and let's begin with prayer and then let's get to our task. You know, I'm, not, I'm not a waiter. I'm a doer. Okay, I'm more like a Martha than a Mary. And I and but I've noticed that as this kind of a spirit creeps into the, into the church of Jesus Christ, it begins to be less and less effective because there's no sense of power that's driving it. It's all, it, be, it finally reduces to who's got the latest and the best idea. And uh, I so appreciated our district superintendent uh, in our last presbytery meeting, for example, encouraging us as leaders in the body of of Christ to spend time in prayer. We we had communion together. I think in a meeting with an agenda the size that would break a you break your jaw, you know, we expected to be there till late into the wee hours of the night and, and all instead and he's he's messing up the day by spending the first two hours in prayer and communion and Bible study and we're i I'm saying, my goodness, we're never going to get anything done today. And here here we closed the meeting in record time because once we had the mind of the Lord on a lot of things, it's amazing how well things went. The joy of His presence. And that's true in our own personal lives. Time spent with the Lord makes things, it gets, brings clarity to life. It's joy in Him. And there'll be joy in heaven with Him. Most of us here, has anybody here ever met any great human being and spent time with them? I mean, what the world calls great? Anybody ever have an hour or two at the White House talking with the President? Just you and him alone? Anybody like that? Nobody in this group has ever done that. Wow. I shook hands one time with Richard Nixon. 
I shook hands with him twice when he was running for president in 1962. I was in his... I was in his presence, had physical contact with him, but he had no aware of having contact with me. And the great thing about our relationship with God is that uh, we're, we're going to be extremely aware that we're in his presence, but he's going to be extremely aware that we're in, we're in his presence too. And go cut both ways, two-way communication, personal fellowship with God. And we can be in the presence of the Lord every day. And then the, the seventh thing that David is thankful for on this anniversary of his being king is a security for the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High he will not be shaken it's just nothing can spring him out of God's love and care so these are great reasons to rejoice in the Lord and when we read this read this psalm we think of those seven things then the psalm switches a tone verses 8 through 12 and, and the theme is on the king and his enemies and, and rather than analyzing this verse by verse, it basically is a calling upon the Lord to uh, enable the king to go out and win more victories, destroy all the enemies, and make the descendants of the enemies perish from the earth and do away with all their wicked schemes. Uh, how do we filter a phrase like this? Did you see in the news last weekend where the fundamentalist pastor in Los Angeles, Heimers is his name, uh, I forget the first initials, R.L. or something like that. He's, as a newspaper, he's always a bald guy. I kind of identify with that. But he was he, William Brennan, the Supreme Court Justice, who wrote the decision on abortion, and he just wrote a new one today, five to four past, if you follow the news today. But uh, he, Brennan was speaking at Loyola, was it Loyola Marymount, Marymount commencement or whatever, and Heimers hired a plane with a banner trailing behind it that was... Uh, praying for the death of the Supreme Court justice. And then later when he was interviewed, he was quoting the psalm, his office, may it be declared vacant and let somebody else take it. And he was saying, well, I'm, I'm, if we're, we're just praying that he be removed from office. And if God has to do that by death, then let him do it. Well, I'm saying, whoa, now he would be really at home in Psalm 21, verses 8 through 12. You know, wouldn't that... And Bob Emmer, whose lifestyle I don't approve of, you know, and in in he writes this column in the Register, and he just took off on that. Of course, he's an agnostic anyway. But there's sometimes you just look back and say, well, does this mean if the kid comes home from school and doesn't like his teacher that day and the little kid's a Christian? He says, oh, God, kill my teacher so I don't have to go back and face that unfairness. I mean, do we have a right to just go to God and say, well, kill people, Lord, right now that, you know, we disagree with? Well, in the Old Testament, they did. But, they, but there was in operation then, in God's plan, the establishment of a monarchy, an earthly kingdom, where God could teach his people the precepts, which they would only understand fully when Jesus came, who taught us a different way. And let's face it, Jesus, David's son, has a different way of handling his enemies than David did. So I look at this passage, and I treat it this way. Number one is, other than the devil, the only enemies I have are the ones inside of me. Okay? Other than the devil, the only enemies I have are the ones inside of me. And therefore, I pray God will slay them all. Kill them dead in the water. Now, maybe you have some enemies. Okay? I, I refuse to call anybody that has odds with me my enemy. So I, I wouldn't... You, if God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, nobody... I don't want to call anybody my enemy. And I, I, very, I doubt that I do anyway, but... So I just simply say the, the enemies are all inside me. And I use a psalm like this and, and, and pray it in a different way than David prayed it. And Jesus himself, I think, used the psalms that way. He did not, he did not pray on the cross. Uh, verses 8 through 12 of Psalm 21, uh, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Secondly, a way that I understand this is that Christ is at this moment in time seeking to reconcile his enemies unto himself. Therefore, at this moment, in, even in the heavens, Jesus is not praying this prayer. He's praying for us, interceding for us. But ultimately, in a prophetic sense, these verses will be fulfilled against all who oppose Christ because God 
will not change the will of someone who refuses to have that will chained, changed. Um, and uh, if God doesn't destroy, in the end time sense, all the enemies, it will simply mean the devil moves into heaven. And I sure don't want to go through in eternity the struggles that you go through in life. Would any of you want to go through this forever? I mean, all the problems that we have with temptation and the problems we have with making enough money to live on and the problems we have in relationships and divorce and alienation between uh, parents and children and between husbands and wives. And my goodness, if God doesn't kill those enemies and sentence them to outer darkness... It just means we're all going to be miserable forever and ever. So sometime there's got to be a line drawn and said, no more, no more. But God in Christ hasn't drawn the line yet until that day. And he still invites us to repentance. Am I understanding the scripture correctly here? Am I saying something that's off the wall or strange? Yes, Ray. Well... Sure, God has enemies now, but He is treating His enemies in a most unusual way. And that is, He is inviting them to be reconciled to Him, to lay down their arms. And instead of declaring war on His enemies, He's offering them the cross. And instead of the clenched fist, He's offering them the open hand that took the nail. It's a strange way to treat your enemies. Yes, in a sense, God has His enemies now, but He's not at all. He's saying, I give you a different opportunity. You don't have to be my enemies.